more than any other geographic location. The District of Columbia is associated with the practice of law and the administration of justice. The DC Bar is now the largest integrated bar in the United States, with more than 110,000 members from all 50 states and over 80 countries who practice in every conceivable area of law and include government, nonprofit, solo practice, and business settings and firms of all sizes. Here at the DC Bar, our mission is to serve our members so that they, in turn, can serve the community. Membership in the DC Bar entitles you to a variety of confidential, in many cases free, services and benefits. Whether you're contacting our legal ethics hotline, obtaining practice management guidance to build or grow your practice, talking to an expert counselor about addiction, stress, or wellness, attending a networking event, or participating in our annual celebration of leadership, our highly trained and responsive staff is ready to assist you. Our nationally accredited continuing legal education program offers hundreds of courses each year in a wide variety of practice areas, ensuring that you can earn CLE credits for any jurisdiction in the country. And here at the DC Bar, we develop future leaders in the law through the John Payton Leadership Academy. The DC Bar also has a long tradition of service, both to its members and to the public. The Bar's service to the public is best demonstrated through our award-winning Pro Bono Center, a national model for providing access to justice for those in our community who cannot afford a lawyer. A separate nonprofit legal services organization, the Pro Bono Center mobilizes 1,500 volunteer lawyers to serve more than 20,000 individuals, nonprofits, and small businesses annually through our full representation clinics, our court-based resource centers and attorneys of the day, and our neighborhood walk-in clinics. Transforming lives by serving our clients where and when they need us most. The DC Bar is a dynamic organization, and much of this valuable work is done by volunteers, like you, participating on our committees, task forces, working groups, and in our communities. We encourage you to get involved and get to know your bar leaders. Our 21 communities have something to offer for everyone, regardless of practice area or experience. These communities provide content to their professional networks and peer groups and get the firsthand opportunity to hear from experts and officials in their field. We are heavily invested in building community. Our newest community is for the law students, and we are hoping to build a pipeline, not only to admission to the DC Bar and its communities, but to prospective employers as well. Students can take advantage of networking events, writing opportunities, mentoring relationships, and leadership programs right alongside our practicing members. Developing these future leaders and giving them the skill set to succeed is a key goal of our organization. I encourage you to explore our website, dcbar.org, where you can find detailed information about our diverse portfolio of program offerings, all of which are designed to reinforce our steadfast commitment to service, integrity, and leadership. Again, the DC Bar is here to assist you in making your practice a successful one. We are committed to serving our members so they can serve the community. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you.
This year, we celebrate the centennial of women's right to vote. But now is not the time to sit back on the laurels of our foremothers. Today, the rights of all voters are still at stake. Nobody's free until everybody's free. Despite the passage of the Voting Rights Act, voter suppression efforts persist, targeting voters of color, Latinx and immigrant voters, LGBTQ voters, and anyone living at the intersection of any of these identities. These suppression efforts include voter roll purges, intimidation efforts, disinformation campaigns, and more. In every state except Maine and Vermont, people convicted of felonies are stripped of their voting rights while in prison. In most states, that ban extends to those on probation or parole, while some states have additional time and fee requirements potentially disenfranchising millions of people. Imagine using a wheelchair or walker and not being able to enter your polling place because there is no ramp. Being visually impaired and being told the voting machine does not offer audio, or having a cognitive disability and being denied the right to vote because of an incorrect assumption about your capabilities. Several federal laws protect voting access for individuals such as these, but they require enforcement to be effective. And despite progress, barriers remain. The vulnerability of voting machines, the reliability of mail-in ballots, foreign interference and manipulation of our election process. You see, simply granting the right to vote was not enough to ensure that all Americans were truly enfranchised. It has taken a century of additional measures to close loopholes and combat discrimination, and the fight is far from over. As we look to the future, surely technology will play a bigger role in our elections. But should it? Can we offer a secure method to vote over the internet? From our phones? You and I have done the best we knew, and so must rest content, leaving all to younger hands. When she wrote those words, Susan B. Anthony had devoted more than 50 years to the women's suffrage movement and victory was nowhere in sight. Yet she remained proud of what she and others had done for the cause and confident that the future would bring even more progress. The trailblazing suffragists who came before us did not wait for change, they worked for change. We must do the same. It's our responsibility to make sure every voice is heard. Now we can begin. Welcome to the second day of our virtual DC Bar 2020 conference, 100 Years of the 19th Amendment, The Fight Continues. Today, we turn our attention to the current and future state of voting rights. We will address gender equality issues involving the rights of the incarcerated, gender equity in education, and equal pay, among others. But first, we take a look at the current challenges and political debates surrounding voter suppression and voting rights in America today. Then, we will turn our attention to the future and ask about the prospects of expanding or contracting the right of all eligible Americans to vote. Today's plenary session is presented by My Case. Please welcome author, lawyer, journalist, and My Case's legal technology evangelist, Nikki Black. Hello, I'm Nikki Black, My Case's legal technology evangelist. My Case, a proud partner of the DC Bar, is a powerful legal practice management solution designed to help law firms get organized, increase efficiency, and deliver an exceptional client experience from anywhere. We begin this morning with a plenary session moderated by DC Court of Appeals Chief Judge Anna Blackburn Rigsby. Sworn in as Chief Judge in 2017, Judge Blackburn Rigsby currently chairs the Joint Committee on Judicial Administration for the District of Columbia. Prior to being designated Chief Judge, she served as DC Superior Court Associate Judge from 2000 to 2006 and as a magistrate judge from 1995 to 2000. For many years, she has taught legal ethics at our public law school, the University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law. Today, she is here to moderate a plenary session on the current state of voting rights. Please welcome Chief Judge Anna Blackburn Rigsby.
Hello, and thank you for joining us for this important panel today. It's my honor to moderate this panel on the current state of voting rights law in our country. We are, are thrilled to have this dynamic and diverse panel to discuss the law and policies underlying our election law in this country. As you've heard, this is the second in three series of our virtual conference. We started yesterday with learning about the past and the importance of the 19th Amendment to enfranchising women in this country. And today we're gonna to explore uh, some of the intricacies of our current state of voting rights law in this country. And I am honored that the DC Bar was able to pivot to make this a virtual conference. As you all know, we were set for an in-person conference. You've done a great job at converting it in this way. I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists and you are in for a lively discussion today where we'll explore the importance of attorneys understanding the law and all of the questions that may come to them as we face our election today and our elections in the future. So without further ado, I'm gonna start with our first panelist um, Mr. Mark Brayton, who is of counsel at Baker Hopstedler. Mark concentrates his work principally on the law of the political process, including work with election and campaign agencies, voting issues, redistricting, and ethics and lobbying regulations. He is a member of the adjunct faculty at the George Washington University and he brings much experience from his work uh, advising committees in our United States Congress. Our next panelist is Donna Edwards, former United States representative for Maryland's fourth congressional district. Ms. Edwards served five terms in Congress in the United States House of Representatives becoming the first African-American woman to represent Maryland. And prior to that, she served for many years as a nonprofit executive and led the National Network to End Domestic Violence, spearheading the effort to pass the Violence Against Women Act in 1994. Our next panelist will be Erin Murphy, a partner at the law firm of Kirkland Ellis here in Washington, DC. Her practice focuses on Supreme Court, appellate, and constitutional lit litigation. Among other recognitions, Ms. Murphy has been recognized by the National Law Journal as one of the nation's outstanding women lawyers and a rising star. She previously clerked for United States Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts. We are also very pleased to be joined today by Nina Perales, Vice President of Litigation for the Mexican American Legal Defense and Environmental Fund and Educational Fund, MALDEF. As Vice President, Ms. Perales supervises the legal staff and litigation docket at MALDEF's offices throughout the United States. Ms. Perales is best known for her work in voting rights. In addition, Ms. Perales specializes in immigrant rights litigation. And our final panelist today is John Sherman, Senior Counsel for the Fair Elections Center, a nonprofit organization. Mr. Sherman is lead counsel on lawsuits challenging arbitrary restoration of the Voting Rights Act. Excuse me, ch challenging the right to restore voting and challenging purges on voter rolls in various states and challenging voter ID laws and more. Prior to joining Fair Elections, the Fair Election Center, a nonpartisan voting rights and election reform organization, Mr. Sherman clerked for Judge Barry Sullivan on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Please welcome all of our distinguished panelists today and their full bios are on the bar's website today. 
So at this time, we are hoping to have a lively interactive discussion today. Uh, we're gonna start with each of the panelists giving us a very brief one to two minute opening statement, and then we'll jump in and field questions to each of the panelists. Are you ready to proceed? We'll start with Mark Braden. Now, Mr. Braden, I, we're having a little trouble hearing you. I thought they were going to unmute me. So okay, sometimes <laughs> I sound better muted than I do live. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and to be on such a distinguished panel. I know a number of these individuals uh, I've worked with in the past in litigation and election related matters, and a lot of qualified folks on this panel that I suggest everybody listen to carefully. Um, I'm pretty much an optimist. Uh, our election system on the whole works quite well. And I, I believe a lot of the problems uh, that we're hearing discussed by a variety of different people on both sides of the political spectrum are a little bit of Cassandra. I, our system works well. Uh, I would suggest though to the audience that during this discussion, you think about what's primarily important the vital single starting point for an election system. And the starting point for an election system is really two. Two are prime. Everything else is secondary. Doesn't mean it's not important, but everything else is secondary. Primary importance is that the winners win. The people who get the most lawful votes win the election. And then equally important, too, is that the rational supporters of the loser believe that the winner won. Everything else, not that it's not important, but everything else is secondary to that. We're gonna have some problems with this election because of the pandemic, um, but I don't believe there are problems that can't be, won't be over, overcome. Discussions of millions of fraudulent votes are crazy. Uh, people also saying that there are, isn't any fraud are also crazy. There is fraud. It's not endemic around the country, but it actually clearly exists. And we are going to have a significantly more mail voting. Mail voting can be done successfully, but without a doubt, mail voting pre presents significant problems in administration and security. And many people's votes won't be counted because they're cast by mail because of misadventure uh, and lack of delivery. So for whatever it's worth, my suggestion to anyone listening to this, the safest way to vote still remains going to a polling place and casting your ballot. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Braden. Um, we'll next hear a brief opening statement from um, uh, co former Congresswoman Donna Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with uh, all of you, even in this virtual environment and uh, to be able to participate with my fellow panelists. Um, you know, I think about the current state that we're in and looking at our history and realize, of course, that um, for hundreds of years, we've conducted elections, we've um, done census counts, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong, uh, but still we've been able to move on to the next election. And I don't think that this one will be any different. What I do think is different in this environment is um, the extent to which um, some are, are, are moving to uh, make sure that some people can't vote and others, others can. And I think that's a challenge for us. Um, I spent many years before I came into Congress uh, working in nonprofit organizations uh, on census counts in the 2000 uh, census. And then of course, in Congress, I got to see the underbelly of what it means to count the votes and then do redistricting and focus on things like uh, ethics and election law reform. And so I've had the perspective of seeing both the inside and the outside and have some ideas that we hope are going to be shared on this panel about ways in which we can do better. And I think um, just in closing, um, our constitution has given us many ways to move forward to enhance and increase uh, voting rights and to build on the 
previous generations. And I think it's up to this generation um, to do the same. And so I look forward to this conversation that we're having today. All righty, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we'll next hear from Erin Murphy, her brief opening statement. Great, and I wanna uh, echo echo everybody in, in saying how wonderful it is to be here with all of you today. Uh, you know, a little different format than we originally envisioned, but one of the great things with election law is it, it's such a rapidly evolving area all the time that I, I think, you know, you're going to end up getting a, a, a very different panel today than you would have if we had this event when we were originally scheduled to have it because there's there's just new topics all the time uh, here. So hopefully that'll make it very engaging and interesting for everybody. Uh, I thought I would take this minute just to tell you uh, just a little bit about my my own background since I, I think I come to all of this a little bit differently than um, than some of our panel members. You know, many people here on this panel today, several of them are, are really election law specialists who do this work day in and day out and and undoubtedly, you know, are, have, have far greater expertise than, than I do. Um, I come at election law from a little bit different perspective. I'm, I'm really more of a generalist in appellate and Supreme Court practice, uh, but happen to have done a lot of Supreme Court work in election law cases. Um, so I, I think my own perspective has been very focused on thinking about how the courts deal with all of this. Um, you know, there's, there's questions about election law policy and there's questions about what the law should be. And there's a lot of difficult questions about how the courts, you know, when and how courts should intervene. I mean, I think the courts were struggling quite a bit with that already. Uh, and we've seen courts, including the Supreme Court, struggle with that quite a bit over the past few months as we've had a lot of litigation happening in the lead up to this election and in conjunction with the pandemic. And so I think there's a lot of great topics we can talk about today in, in thinking about it from that perspective of how to both the federal and the state judiciary think about their role in uh, pr protecting the right to vote, but also in uh, thinking about the deference that they owe to the political branches in an area that is inevitably fraught with politics. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Um, we'll next hear an uh, opening statement from Nina Perales of MALDA. Thank you very much. And uh, I also want to say that it's such a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to join you today uh, I'm in a different time zone uh, and, and absolutely thrilled to be with you today uh, from San Antonio, Texas, uh, with so many wonderful panelists and, and I know so many wonderful lawyers in the audience. Uh, at MALDEF, at the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, we focus on the Latino voter in our political access program. And so the themes for us as we focus on the Latino voter really have to do with demographic growth as Latinos uh, increase in their population, not just in individual states, but around the whole country. Uh, and the challenges uh, that increased demographic growth and increased political participation pose to the status quo whether that's a local school board election where Latinos are seeking perhaps to elect the first Latino school board member in a particular area, or even at higher levels, including congressional elections and even statewide elections. Uh, Latino voters tend to be much younger uh, in terms of our age structure than other voters. So some of the issues that we deal with have to do with access to voting for people who are voting for the very first time or who may not be persistent voters, but uh, vote in elections that they become aware of that are particularly important. Um, in terms of the frame that we use, we don't really use a partisan frame. Latinos are quite diverse uh, and can choose the candidate uh, of their choice and that can pose uh, you know, a, a threat to the status quo, whether an incumbent happens to be a Democrat or a Republican. And so we've done work, uh, particularly in redistricting, uh, but also in other areas that can sometimes challenge the interests of one party or another. Um, and we've challenged uh, barriers to participation. And we also challenge specific policies that are intended to limit Latino voting. 
So that's our perspective. Thank you, thank you. And uh, we'll hear an opening statement at this point from John Sherman of uh, Senior Counsel for Fair Elections, for the Fair Elections Center. Thank you, thank you, Your Honor. Um, and thanks very much for the, to the organizers of this panel. Um, it's a, a pleasure to serve, you know, and participate in a panel with such distinguished and accomplished uh, lawyers and uh, Congresswoman Edwards as well. Um, it's, it's wonderful to uh, participate with all of you. Um, I, I want to, I'll be brief, you know, I want to say that this election is an unprecedented election. I think in some ways it should give folks comfort that um, it will be held in accordance with the rules. Um, it is a normal election in that way and people should have comfort in that fact, but it is an unprecedented election in that uh, it's being held for three, for three main reasons. One, because of the pandemic. Uh, two, because of the pandemic has forced an unprecedented shift to absentee mail-in voting. Uh, that shift has caused uh, an extreme burden, uh, an extreme strain on election offices throughout the country as they try to process absentee ballot applications. And it's also caused uh, a strain on the U.S. Postal Service, which was already under uh, severe stress. And the USPS has experienced delivery delays and failures, and that's affecting the right to vote. Um, no one could have predicted even nine months ago that we, we would be talking about the interaction between uh, the US Postal Service um, and the right to vote in normal years. It's not an issue, uh, but here we are. And I wanna note at the outset that over 250 cases have been filed um, in the run up to this election. Um, not all of them are strictly COVID pandemic cases, but they are all pandemic adjacent. Uh, the pandemic has sort of sent normal, uh, the normal course of voting rights litigation into turbo drive. Um, and in participating and answering some of the questions um, that are posed by the moderator today, I'll try to clarify, you know, what's been filed, why it's been filed and where uh, my organization, Fair Election Center, has uh, sought to sort of vindicate the constitutional rights of voters uh, given these pandemic conditions. All right, thank you, Mr. Sherman. Um, so now we're gonna go uh, into our discussion and I'm gonna be fielding questions to each of the panelists um, in the general order that we had discussed, but I may shift or pivot um, as I'm about to do right now. So. Uh, Fasten your seatbelts, and I think if we could try to keep our answers um, uh, thorough but reasonably short so that we'll have a chance to ask each of you about the same number of questions and still have time at the end for some questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit, and I'm going to start with Congresswoman Edwards. Um, the theme of this year's conference, 100 Years of the 19th Amendment, honors the sacrifices and persistence of courageous women behind the fight for the right to vote. As a result, I'd like to start the conversation today by asking what forms of modern day um, uh, uh, voter issues or, or um, uh, that do you see existing for the electorate at this time? Uh, what a great question. I mean, I think it's a, a, a the, for me, the um, 100 year anniversary as a black woman is a really challenging one. Um, my grandmother didn't get the right to vote until 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And when I think about um, the Voting Rights Act and where we are now, we're having the same conversation about who gets in and who's left out and how. And what are the, um, you know, what are the the barriers that are in place that um, prevent or allow one person to vote o over another? Whether that is, you know, um, making sure that voters are registered and challenges to those registrations, or people showing up at the polls and maybe being uh, intimidated, or people showing up at the polls um, signing a signature and that signature doesn't match and their vote doesn't count. And so I think that those um, kind of challenges are kind of modern day uh, ways in which we still need to build on the foundation 
of voting and the foundation of the Voting Rights Act in this sort of next iteration? Well, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Perales. I'm going to uh, shift to you as, as we're celebrating this 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment amidst an ongoing pandemic. Given these challenging times, um, made more challenging by COVID-19, what is your biggest concern with regard to issues surrounding voting rights, um, particularly as it affects the, the Hispanic and Latino communities? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that were already mentioned by both Mark and John. Uh, and I think the, the first big concern uh, that we have has to do with the way that people are going to change the way they cast ballots because of the pandemic, right? So changes in the way that people are going to participate, changes in the way people are going to vote. Uh, and the alternate arrangements that have been set up by different jurisdictions to try to accommodate that. And of course, the first one that everyone thinks about and that a lot of people are talking about have to do with mail ballots. And the challenge here is that although there's always been mail balloting, people have voted by mail uh, routinely uh, and well for a long time, is we're going to see a lot more mail ballots than we did before. And that poses a couple of challenges. One challenge on, on election staff in various places, and elections are typically run by counties, uh, although some are run by cities, they're usually run by counties, uh, is limited number of staff and a lot of requests for mail ballots. And so election officials have to make sure that they respond to all the requests for mail ballots. And some of them may come in very close to the deadline, right? And, and folks in election offices have got to process those applications for mail ballots and get them back out to the voters. And then the, the flip side of that in terms of a challenge is counting all the mail ballots when they come back in, right? And that means that uh, we may see delays in reporting of election results, which doesn't mean that anything bad is happening. It just means that counties are going through their regular process of opening the ballots, making sure that it came from the voter who says that they cast it, uh, and then tabulating it, right? Counting it up. So mail balloting is, I think we're gonna hear a lot about mail ballots as we get closer to the election and even on election night. A lot of folks are used to turning on the TV, whatever your station of choice is and seeing a big map of the country with states being you know, shaded in blue or red. I don't think that that's a realistic scenario uh, for this election. Uh, I'm not sure it was ever a realistic scenario because it was never really based on full counting of votes. But here in this election in particular, I think we're all going to have to have a lot of confidence in the process and exercise more patience. And then, of course, for those who do choose to vote in person, who feel that it's safe and it's something that they would prefer to do, uh, there are also different types of arrangements in polling places with social distancing, with masks. It might take a little bit longer to vote. And people are going to have to be patient with that as well. But I, I think like all other election lawyers, uh, I reiterate that we have a, a fantastic voting system here in the United States. And people ought to feel confident about that system having you know, good pieces in place so that we can get to a very trustworthy and reliable outcome at the end. Thank you. Um John Sherman from the uh, Council for Fair Election Center, you mentioned in your opening statements a number of cases that have already been filed related to some of the logistical challenges, um, which uh, I think may raise constitutional and other legal issues. Can you tell us about some of these cases and the kinds of issues that you are seeing litigated across the country? Definitely, um, and, and I think it's important to distinguish at the outset between the kinds of voting rights cases that were being brought before the pandemic's onset, but that have been kicked, you know, turbocharged by it, um, and the kinds of cases that have come after the onset of the pandemic, 
and are sort of really unique uh, to the pandemic and the constitutional issues that they raise are unique to the pandemic. All of these, I'm gonna take in-person voting off the table because largely in-person voting is the safety issues there are a function of the provision of personal protective equipment, how you organize a polling place. A lot of this litigation has mostly, predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly been over mail-in voting. Um, you know, a lot of these cases that uh, existed prior to the pandemic concerned signature matching, signature verification, whether there's an opportunity to cure a mismatch in a signature, uh, restrictions on who can collect a ballot from someone and deliver it, uh, absentee ballot cure procedures um, in order to comply with due process rights for voters, they have to be given an opportunity to cure a minor defect with a ballot such that it can be counted. Uh, we have a claim like that in the case we brought in North Carolina that was successful um, so that there's now a cure procedure in North Carolina, a state that has largely done in-person voting for decades. In the 2016 election, North Carolina electorate voted at a rate of 4% by mail. It's expected to go as high as 40% because of the pandemic. It's a state that doesn't have a ton of experience with mail-in voting, um, and it's extremely important that there be a cure procedure if people who are first-time mail-in voters make a mistake on their ballot. These are the kinds of cases that existed prior to the pandemic, but they've been brought an even greater number in with even greater intensity because of the pandemic. Um, I will note that uh, one of the folks who was originally scheduled to be on the pandemic has been from Perkins Coie, who is, Perkins Coie has lit a great deal of these cases. And I think it should be acknowledged that they've been in that, uh, in that fight all around the country, bringing these types of cases. Um, cases that have cropped up because of the pandemic, specifically since the onset of, of the pandemic, concern uh, absentee eligibility, who gets to vote by mail, in most states, that's not an issue. Um, it's, by no, it's no excuse absentee voting. Anyone can receive a mail-in absentee ballot. But in a number of states still, sadly, it's only by excuse. And states like Texas, Louisiana, Tennessee have fought tooth and nail uh, to preserve those restrictions. And this interacts with the pandemic because um, many folks in the voting rights community I think justifiably believe if you're at risk from the virus because you have an underlying uh, condition that puts you at higher risk of severe complications or death, you should be able per se to vote by absent, absentee uh, by mail. Um, if you're, uh, say in Louisiana, even under the new ruling in that state uh, that allows someone who is COVID vulnerable to vote by mail, their partner, or someone who is a cohabitant in their house, that person, if they're not vulnerable, they can't vote by mail, but the person who is vulnerable can. That kind of hair splitting makes no sense and in, in my view is still unconstitutional and unresolved. Other challenges uh, that have cropped up during uh, the pandemic include challenges to witness requirements for absentee voting, uh, where a, fo a voter has to obtain a witness signature on their ballot, have someone observe that they voted and then have a witness sign, uh, extensions of receipt deadlines, uh, ballot delivery fail safes, uh, if your vote doesn't come in the mail, if your ballot doesn't come in the mail, an extension of the deadline to return it isn't of much use to you. So we've fought uh, very hard, both in North Carolina and particularly in Wisconsin, in a case that's now pending before the Supreme Court, uh, for an alternative uh, delivery method. These alternative delivery methods are used for military and overseas voters, email delivery, online access, uh, but they're not being used and they could be used for COVID vulnerable voters. Um, I could say more about all of these and I, I can at a later point, but um, I, I don't want to take up too much time or space. So I'll pause there and we can we can resume, you know, in the course of discussion. Okay, I just wanted to ask one brief follow up question, uh, John. Are you finding that the bulk of cases are being brought in state courts or federal courts or starting in the state court and then working their way through the federal courts? It's a great question. Uh, predominantly, these cases are brought, uh, many of them have been brought in federal court. Uh, but in some cases, there, there's been a lot of activity in the Michigan state court system. In Pennsylvania state court, there was a ruling by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania that extended the absentee ballot deadline. That case just 
yesterday or two days ago, uh, was at the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, deadlocked 4-4 and there was no opinion as to whether or not to take uh, take that case on an emergency basis. So that ruling from the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, at least for the moment, will stay in place. There's been a lot of activity in the North Carolina state court system. So yes, some of yes, uh, absolutely. Some of these cases have been brought under state constitutional provisions to prove up the same type of claim that there's an undue burden on the right to vote when a voter is forced to choose between their health and the right to vote by being forced essentially to vote in person uh, because either they're not eligible to vote absentee or because of some problem with either an overwhelmed election office or an overwhelmed postal service, they can't get their ballot on time. Thank you. Um, Aaron Murphy, based on your experience of practicing before the Supreme Court and, and other appellate court forums, how have the courts um, reacted? What is um, your, what are your thoughts on the role the court should play in election law? Um, and I guess I want to ask you if you would also comment maybe more specifically on the Shelby County versus Holder case um, that was before the Supreme Court in 2013. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, you know, one of the things that's been really interesting about this huge wave of litigation over the past few months is how quickly a lot of it really has found its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and, and I think, candidly, if the court had a druthers, like, I think they would like to not be involved in a lot of this litigation. Um, but the reality is, uh, not just in the pandemic context, but more generally through a variety of reasons, some having to do with aspects of the court's docket that's known as mandatory jurisdiction. Um, the court just can't kind of avoid these cases, even though I think they would they would like to. Um, and I think you can kind of see that in some of the court's decisions in recent years, if you step back from the pandemic and think about a case like, um, like Shelby County or like Rucho v. Common Cause, the partisan gerrymandering case from a few years ago, I think that, that a bit of a theme of the Supreme Court's biggest cases in recent years has been, we'd like the federal courts to be less involved and to be leaving more of state election, more, more of election law to states, which are, are making kind of the, uh, the, the laws themselves in the first instance. I mean, I think you've really seen that come to a, a head in particular in the, the way that the Supreme Court has been dealing with all of these uh, cases that have found their way up over the past few months. Um, most of these, and you, you may not have kind of seen as much of them because they occur on what, what is generally known as the court's shadow docket. Um, these aren't cases where the court has taken something up and heard argument and put out uh, an opinion that resolves ultimate issues. They've all come to the court in uh, basically emergency postures where people are asking the court to stay something that a lower court has done. Um, and, and so they've, and the court deals with these, you know, on a highly expedited basis. Often there's just a couple weeks of briefing going back and forth, and then an order comes out and the court, you know, either grants or denies a stay. I mean, I think that the approach the court has taken is is probably to me, you know, best articulated uh, first back in a case earlier this summer that dealt with um, with the challenges to the Wisconsin primary, but but I think also articulated pretty well in a in a separate opinion that that Justice Kavanaugh authored uh, probably a couple of weeks ago now, and and what the court has been doing is basically. Um, enforcing a principle known as the Purcell principle that, that, that the court had years ago had a case called Purcell in which it said that federal courts shouldn't be changing the rules of an election close to the election itself. And that's really the guiding principle that we've seen the Supreme Court using in resolving these cases. They've been saying federal courts, you know, we, we think that in the first instance, uh, in, in, in the majority of instances that state election law should control the election, especially when we're very, very close to an election. And so if you have a federal court decision below that did change 
uh, state election law that ordered changes that said we're going to expand something or we're going to um, we're going to you know suspend the operation of some aspect of state law. You see the Supreme Court consistently staying those decisions and saying no, we're going to put the status quo back in place. Um, conversely, if cases make their way to the Supreme Court where what the emergency relief being requested is asking the court basically to put uh, to 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 itself kind of have a stay that would alter state election law, you see the court denying those requests. So, and, and as um, Judge, Judge Justice Kavanaugh articulated in this opinion recently, he said, you know, this is a combination of two things, this general percent Purcell principle that we don't want the federal courts uh, interfering with, you know, kind of upsetting the status quo when we're very close to an election and a broader principle, um, particularly in the context he articulated of the pandemic, of the, the level of deference that the court views itself as required to give to states that are dealing with a public health crisis emergency, and kind of that notion that the court itself is going to view the judiciary as really the, the branch of government that should perhaps be in a little bit of a back seat with dealing with some of these unprecedented issues. The one thing I would note is, you know, we did get an interesting data point just this week um, Chief, Chief Judge, to your question about state litigation versus federal litigation, you know, most of these cases have come to the court in the context of federal litigation. And so it was a little unclear if the court viewed this Purcell principle the same way uh, in a case arising out of federal court versus a case arising out of state court. This week, the court had a case, as, as John mentioned, where they deadlocked 4-4 on what to do with it. And that was a case where a state court had altered the state laws uh, regarding election. And you know, the argument was made by the, the folks seeking a stay that look, this falls within the Purcell principle, you've got a court changing the rules. And this time um, the chief justice who's been, you know, as best we can tell, they don't always tell you even how everybody voted, but you know, presumably has been in the majority on all of these stays. This time he was he was not with the, the court's other conservative members and the court deadlocked. And, and I my best reading of what's going on there is that at least he views the principle as specific to federal courts and not, not generally applicable to courts such that, you know, he kind of puts state courts in the same bucket as state legislatures and views this more as a federalism issue than necessarily a, um, you know, a, a courts versus legislative branches issue. So you know, it, it, we're always uh, kind of tea leaf reading with things with the court, but that, that's sort of my best sense of what's going on there. Well, I, I had one uh, follow-up question when you mentioned the federalism issue. Um, is there um, a concern from, from your perspective as you analyze these cases um, that if the federal courts um, do uh, step back or uh, follow the Purcell principle for national elections, um, does that present a, a, a problem when we're talking about election law um, in a national election versus perhaps more state and local elections? You know, I, I think the court views the, the the role of states as every bit as important in regulating the federal elections as the state elections. I mean, the Constitution gives the states the power to set the time, place, and manner for the federal elections, um, and the court views that as the the role that the states play in this back and forth. I, I think that's the majority of this current Supreme Court, at least, views that role of the states as really important. I, I also think that. You know, if you if you think about this also in, a, in just a little bit more of a realpolitik way, that for the court, um, it's a principle that 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 it can try to apply in a way that is a little less political. Because one of the difficulties of the court is they're just trying so hard to resolve these inherently political cases in ways that don't seem political. And if you can have a general principle like, look, we're going to defer to states on what they're doing in in pandemic times whether they're kind of states that are being more aggressive or less aggressive, we're still going to defer. At least it gives the court a principle that it can apply that seems a little bit less, you know, will look a little bit less to people like something the court's doing that's kind of picking winners and losers. All right. Well, we're going to circle back to this issue with some of our questions later, um, uh, because I think there may be some of our pals that might contend that um, some of the um, uh, federal recent federal decisions like the elimination of the preclearance clause of the um, Voting Rights Act of 1964 uh, may may have an impact um, 
that is unintended in terms of uh, some voter suppression efforts that folks have argued may be underway in some states. So I'm gonna turn to Ms. Perales um, to ask this question. Um, uh, have you seen any um, tactics that have had the um, either unintended or uh, impact of suppressing uh, votes in the work that MALDEF has done around the country? Well, definitely yes. Um, and I, because there's a lot when it comes to tactics that uh, can suppress the Latino vote, I figured I would pick one example, which is the state that I happen to live in, uh, Texas. And Texas has done uh, several things uh, in the past decade, I would say, to make voting less accessible. And this trend of making voting less accessible has occurred in parallel with the increase in the number of Latinos being eligible to vote in Texas and Latinos coming forward and voting in Texas. So for example, uh, within the past 10 years, although Texas has always had a fairly restrictive set of rules around who can help people register to vote, Texas went ahead and tightened those already restrictive rules on who can help somebody register to vote. So now in Texas, if you want to, let's say, go to a local fair and you wanna help people fill out their voter registration forms, uh, you can't just do that. Uh, you have to become deputized by your county election officials now that was an old uh, requirement that we had for many, many years because Texas is a Southern state. But what, what Texas did recently was even made it harder to get deputized. So uh, now you have to do a training to become a deputy, to be able to help people register to vote. And your deputization will expire now after two years. So you have to keep going back and renewing your deputization. And then finally, you can only register voters or help them register to vote in the counties where you are deputized. So you can't go to Austin, to South by Southwest, film and music festival and register people from who come there to attend from all over Texas, unless you've managed to get yourself deputized in all 254 of our counties. So that would be one example of the way in which Texas is tightening existing rules around access to voting. On the voting side, of course, uh, many people know that Texas is voter ID restrictions, uh, which were making even tighter Texas's pre-existing voter ID law. Those restrictions were struck down uh, in federal court and affirmed by the Fifth Circuit as having a disparate racial impact on African-American and Latino voters. And then uh, finally, the last example I would give is from recently, just a couple of years ago, we litigated uh, Texas attempting to expel from the voter rolls about 98,000 registered voters who were um, naturalized U.S. citizens. Uh, and we were able to uh, challenge that in federal court and get a TRO and then ultimately successfully settle that case with Texas so that it would not use information about people's green card status, right? Or their previous status as having been lawful permanent residents to then challenge their voter registration after they naturalized uh, and became voters. So those would be just from the state of Texas, um, which doesn't mean it's the whole picture, but just some examples of um, ways in which states can sometimes react by tightening access to the ballot, it, at least our perspective is that that reaction is because of a change in the face of the electorate. Okay, um, Mark, Braden, thanks for your patience as we circle back to you, but um, based on your um, work and expertise in the um, political process and election law, redistricting, um, issues which we often think of as, as sort of hot button electoral or election issues. Uh, what are some of your um, uh, 
uh, reactions and responses to some of the comments made about efforts to either limit access to the ballot or uh, where and when the court should enter into the, the, the electoral process, which some may view as inherently a political one. And uh, uh, just share with us some of your reactions and expertise here. Sure, I don't need to invent any new language. It, the moving into election litigation is in fact invading the political thicket, which has lots of thorns. And I think we should be careful in, in assuming that any judge, whether it be a state judge or a federal judge, has a better understanding of election administration than the people who enacted the law administrated and or the people who are actually administrating it. So as a starting point, I'm quite skeptical of, of litigation. My experience of most of the litigation, to be candid with you, you can't extract partisanship from the litigation. And much of the litigation is driven by some belief, rightly or wrongly, I would have to say often wrongly, as to the impact of the particular change in that a court might order as to the results following the election in November. The, the nationwide, there's been a continuing expansion really pretty much across the board with some limited exceptions of the ability and the ease of casting ballots. No question about that. Uh, early voting is much more prevalent around the country. Um, the promise of early voting though hasn't been realized. Early voting and the statistics on this and the studies in this are relatively clear, has little or no impact on turnout rates. It, I, one would have assumed it would, but in fact, the studies on that are abundantly clear, it doesn't. And in fact, the long lines we see on TV complaining about uh, you know, failure of election administration are usually long lines for early voting locations, which by its very nature has to be much more limited. The lines, which really do exist in some places at, at, on election day, tend to be much smaller uh, than you know, voting in advance, which was designed to be a fairly truncated process limited to those people who couldn't show up and vote in person. The, the, it, there is no way to extract politics from election law. So you, you, it, it's not possible to do that. So we have to just simply accept the fact that all the decisions, the litigants on the whole are thinking about the impact of the process at the back end. Doesn't mean it's a wrong process. Doesn't mean the litigation shouldn't be brought, but we shouldn't assume that people aren't making the political calculations as to whether this will help or hurt. The, the, process of voting by mail and the expansion of it is certainly necessary based upon the pandemic because of the fear of people going to vote in person who have legitimate concerns. And frankly, I used to, I'll joke about this since my hair color is the same now. When I was first involved in election administration, we used to joke about the Q-tips running our election system, which would was the fact that at most of our polling places around the country, the people who are actually sitting behind the tables have gray hair like mine now, and, and older retired people. So one of the problems we have with voting in person in this cycle is going to be the fear of those older folks to be administrating the election too. So these are all legitimate concerns, but I will just say at the back end, the mail voting has problems. I'm not saying, it, it's not where we have to go, but don't ignore the problems. One, last time I checked, the Postal Service took the position about 4% of the mail doesn't get delivered. Uh, voting by mail involves individuals filling out a government form. Guess what? That presents a problem to a lot of individuals. Voting by mail, if you overvote, or don't complete a race, if you're doing it in person, the little machine kicks out your vote and you get a chance to correct on the spot. It doesn't work that way uh, by voting by mail. And 120 years ago, the country adopted the Australian ballot so people could vote in secret uh, to avoid intimidation and undue influence. 
That's the problem with mail voting because you're not in an environment where people can't be standing over your shoulder to influence your vote. And those are real concerns. Intimidation can and is real in the context. Let's be candid. How many times uh, that a family receives three or four absentee ballots and one person votes them all? Maybe I know how my wife wants to vote. I'm not sure my wife thinks that I know how she wants to vote. <laughs> so those are real issues. So absolutely, we, we need to be concerned about one side, but there is a countervailing argument. There are legitimate concerns about the election process. The people most likely to be adversely influenced by this are the people who have bad mail service. Who are they? People who live in rural areas, probably Republicans, and the people who live in poor urban areas, probably Democrats. So this is a problem for both sides. This is actually, in fact, not necessarily, I would view as a partisan issue. All right, well, well you've given us a lot to chew on. Uh, I'm gonna come back to you, Mark, um, to, to ask you about redistricting in just sure. a minute. Um, but I wanted to, um, turn for a second back to Congresswoman Edwards um, on the discussion of the Shelby County case. Um, and I'd like to hear your views, Congresswoman Edwards, about the court's decision in Shelby County that um, um, uh, whether there are any statistics, or, um, information that you've observed of how it's impacted voting in your area. Well, and not so much in my area, but what I will say, building on um, what Nina <coughs> Parra, um discussed, is that after the Shelby decision and basically the removal of pre-clearance pre pre requirements in uh, these number of voting rights states and districts, there was an explosion in state legislatures of restricted um, um, rules around voter ID, voter registration, all of these things that really, um, you know, pre-Shelby, many of these states, particularly Southern states, simply would not have been able to do. And that has created problems that we're now seeing in the election, in the current election, in terms of um, some of the challenges. I do think that there's been this window since the Shelby decision where the court essentially um, laid out in, in some ways a map for the political process, for policymakers to design a fix to Shelby that would have forestalled some of these problems. And what you see, whether it's at the national level or in um, state courts is, you know, you've got divided government, highly partisan, um, and legislation basically sitting on the shelf uh, for the last couple of years. Um, the now renamed, you know, John Lewis um, voting rights legislation is sitting and passed out of the house and is sitting in the Senate. And I think that you know, I think one thing that I do agree with uh, Mark about is that all of this is inherently uh, political, and um, and you can't get you can't get around that. But I, I, I think it's really fair if you look across the country, um, look at what's happening, for example, in South Carolina now, that many of those um, of the problems that we're seeing with. Uh, signature requirements and trying to cure uh, ballots is directly related uh, to Shelby on what I describe as Shelby on the loose. Um, and the fact that we have not uh, been able to have Department of Justice intervention to make sure that there's fairness in this process. And then finally, because I can't, I don't know how much time we're going to have left uh, to get to it, there is not a problem with mail in voting. Uh, that there are a couple of states, Oregon and Washington, that have been doing mail-in voting forever, Colorado, and it um, and it works. And I think that um, you know, in the environment that we're in now, um, really 
um, trying to discourage voters in some ways or frighten voters um, that somehow their mail-in ballot is not going to be able to get where it needs to be, whether it's in a drop box or uh, through the mail and be counted, is really doing a disservice um, to the electorate. And, uh, and I think that the greater challenge is, as has been described, that we're going to have a lot of ballots to count and that we're going to have to be patient and that people who are leaders and um, um, involved in the process are going to have to urge patience as we count the vote. And I've described that we don't have an election season anymore. I mean, an election day anymore. We have an election season. And that means that we have to wait wait for every ballot that has been legitimately cast in every state uh, to be counted, and then we'll declare a winner. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Edwards. I'm going to uh, shift to John Sherman. I wanted to get your comments on uh, some of the um, uh, things that have been mentioned as potential um, barriers to people casting their votes. Um, and I also wanted to throw in some things that you may hear from the news uh, recently about um, whether polling places um, have been moved or closed, um, sort of apart from the pandemic issues. Um, uh, whether uh, there's been some discussion on the news about the legitimacy of certain mail drop ballot boxes um, are you seeing litigation around these and, and um, uh, voter ID laws and, and other types of issues? Could you tell us a little bit about that, John? For sure. Um, and, and there are a couple different um, issues there. Um, one drop boxes have been litigated um, in, in certain places. They are, they're going forward. They've been deployed everywhere. Um, there's no issue. They're secure. Um, people are using it, have used it in the past, before the pandemic, we'll use it during the pandemic, we'll use it after the pandemic. Um, and it's a secure way to, for folks to deliver the ballot without fear of delay uh, from the U.S. Postal Service interfering with them casting their ballot. Um, and that, that you know, alternative, though, that of, of drop boxes has been restricted in certain states, in Ohio and Texas. In both of those states, uh, they've restricted uh, drop boxes to one per county um, on some notion that all counties must be treated the same no matter what the differences in population are. Uh, it's been litigated in both states. I don't know the current uh, uh, status. I believe the lower courts enjoined uh, those restrictions and then those injunctions were promptly stayed by uh, the circuit courts in both the Sixth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit. I don't know the current status, but uh, it's been a fight. It's been a fight everywhere. It shouldn't be. It's, it helps all voters from, you know, Republican voters, Libertarian voters, Democratic voters. Uh, but that has been one of the issues. I did want to go back to uh, one of the things that has been said about deference to state legislatures uh, during this public health crisis. Last night, uh, the Fourth Circuit on Bonk in a 12-3 decision uh, rejected a collateral attack on some of these voting rights wins and remedies that uh, we've secured in that state for this unprecedented shift to absentee voting. Um, and that was a good, you know, good decision, may still have uh, some life to play out uh, in this election. We'll see what happens. But last night, I do want to note the dissenting opinion in that case, the three judges who signed on to it, wrote the statutes of state legislatures are our sole North Star. I don't, I, I'm be, and I'm being completely respectful here of the judges who signed on to this, but I, I simply don't understand how this sentence is consistent with Marbury v. Madison, with judicial review. We have a constitution in the United States and the voters' constitutional rights are infringed by state, legis, state statutes, then those, st those constitutional rights supersede any state statutes. And I, I think the easiest way to talk about this is to make it concrete. Um, we have a client uh, in Wisconsin in the case that's about alternative ballot delivery methods. This client, uh, Kate Colbeck, she was diagnosed with cancer just before the pandemic hit, uh, re really took off in March. Uh, she cannot 
safely go to the polls to vote in person. It's not an option. It's not an option practically. It's not an option, in my view, constant as a constitutional matter. It's an undue burden on her right to vote. Cancer is the first thing the CDC lists on its list of at-risk factors. Not only is she at risk from the, the possibility of complications or death from COVID-19 because she's been diagnosed with cancer, it, back in March, she had to request an absentee ballot uh, because she could only get life, obtain life-saving surgery if she tested negative for COVID-19. She could not, she absolutely could not take any risk of contracting the virus. So she applies for an absentee ballot and it doesn't, weeks in, weeks in advance of the election, not at the last minute, and it doesn't come. It doesn't come in the mail. And so she contacts her municipal clerk's office in Milwaukee and they say, we'll send you another one. And that ballot doesn't come. And Kate didn't get to vote in the April 7th election because of a combination of her health condition, uh, US Postal Service delivery failures, the glut of you know, absentee ballot application requests. And that's the real impact on voters. So it cannot be said that the constitution has no role here. That's a violation of the first and 14th amendments because there's an undue burden on the right to vote when a voter is essentially forced to choose between taking an enormous risk, a severe risk to their health and casting a vote uh, in, in this democracy. All right, thank you, John. We're gonna have two, two final questions for uh, Mark Braden and Aaron Murphy. And then I know we have a number of, of questions appearing in our live chat. Um, so Mark, I wanted to pivot back to you um, again, you are an expert on redistricting, and I'm going to ask you when I know maybe a loaded question. Okay. Tell me about redistricting versus gerrymandering. What's uh, the well, it, you know, that's the classic situation uh, in the eye of a beholder. It's a little bit like art. Um, almost everyone who doesn't like the political result of a plan would describe it as a gerrymander. Um, uh, we have a in most of our states, we have a district-based system. Uh, that in the most of our states, that district-based system has politicians drawing the lines. Um, that's sort of the way the constitution, our US constitution is set up and it's the way most state constitutions are, are set up. And shockingly enough, uh, politics has played a role uh, in the line drawing process since the beginning of our country, and frankly, prior to the beginning of our country, the British had a notorious rotten borough system. So uh, certainly there are a variety of ways in which you can limit, for want of a better description, partisan lust in the drawing of districts uh, and by various geographic and demographic, you can, you can impose the notion of following political subdivisions. You limit partisan gerrymandering through equal population requirements. You can limit it in a variety of different ways. It's unrealistic to think that you can get rid of it altogether. Uh, you can say, well, we have the courts do it. That simply moves the partisan dispute from a partisan body to a court and really brings them into the political thicket as a political player. There's no quote unquote silver bullet that would turn the process non-political because where you draw the lines has an effect on who wins and loses so long as we have a geographically based system. I don't hear much political support for getting rid of our geographically based system. You can have commissions and some of them work well, some of them don't work well. Um, I am wildly opposed to nonpartisan commissions because I frankly don't know anybody who isn't a partisan that has the expertise to draw line drawing. Bipartisan commissions work and can work. There's still partisan line drawing involved in them too, but at least you have people involved who understand the politics of line drawing. Let me just say that political decision-making in the line drawing process isn't a bad thing necessarily. Uh, I did some litigation in Ohio uh, over the congressional plan and the proposed remedy um, was a plan 
that would have taken the Speaker of the House out of the United States Congress, John Boehner. Mm -hmm. I have to say that that wouldn't strike me as being have been in the best interest of the citizens of Ohio. The actual decision making of political in looking at the line drawing process and, and in some cases determining who might have a better chance to win or lose is not necessarily bad for the citizens of the state. Not all members of Congress are created equal. If you, in Ohio, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, actually having the Speaker of the House from your state is probably advantageous to you. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, our last question for the panel, and then we're gonna jump to our chat, is to Aaron uh, Murphy. I guess without providing an opinion as to the outcome of any particular case. Are there any cases pending before the Supreme Court or other jurisdictions uh, that you encourage the attendees to uh, be on the lookout for? And if so, what, what, what are the potential issues being teed up in these cases? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so so for one, there's obviously, as we've been talking about, all of these kind of cases going on in the shadow docket all over the country. Um, but but I think that there's also once once we're kind of past <laughs> past the crisis of the moment, um, the, the the Supreme Court recently granted cert in a case that it's going to hear um, uh, probably I think in January about a, a an Arizona statute, a ballot harvesting statute that was um, that was held unconstitutional by the Ninth Circuit, and that the Supreme Court has has agreed to take up. I think it's going to be a really interesting case that that actually gets at some of the things that we've been talking about today in terms of you know that interplay between. Uh, deference to states and protection of of voting rights, and in particular, I think it's a case that um, that that has Shelby County very much in the backdrop of it. I mean, one thing you just have to remember about Shelby County is, you know, what the court was dealing with is is Section Five of of, of the VRA put put only some states in the position of having restrictions on the laws they could pass um, and, and didn't require, you know, most states to go to the, the U.S. Justice Department or to federal courts to get permission to change their election laws. So what I think bothered the court a lot was the idea that, you know, we kind of singled out states and declared them bad actors and said, your laws are so inherently suspect that you need the federal government's permission to enact them. Um, and that's what the court, you know, got rid of in, in Shelby County. Um, in the wake of that, I think we've seen a little bit of a resurgence of the same principles by courts looking at cases through the lens of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and saying, okay, maybe we don't have Section 5 anymore, but we can still take the same history of you, you know, being discriminatory. Maybe it's 40 years ago, maybe it's 60 years ago, maybe as in this Arizona case, they're talking about you know, things the state was doing in the 1800s at points um, and, and saying, we're going to take that and kind of view everything you do today through that lens of assuming that, you know, you get a little bit of a thumb on the scale of being a bad actor. Um, I think that's a big dynamic of this particular case. And frankly, I think it's something that will interest the court. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's indications that a few of them have already expressed a little bit of interest in that trend in a few other cases. So I think that's going to be a big case to watch that may tell us a bit, you know, wholly apart from the, the, the immediacy of what's going to happen with the, the this election and what the court's doing surrounding it, of just where the court's election law jurisprudence may be going, especially if we, you know, as it looks like we will uh, have a new membership of the court by the time that case is heard. Thank you. Um, now, we have about a uh, uh, seven or eight minutes left um, for questions that are coming into the chat room. And I apologize in advance because we've got so many questions, we're not gonna get to all of them. So I'm gonna ask uh, our panelists to be super brief on these. We're gonna call this a rapid round robin session. Um, um, the question is, if you could champion one voting rights issue over all others, what would it be? Can we get like a one word or two word answer from folks? Let's start with um, um, Nina Perales. Oh, well, thank you. And this dovetails nicely with uh, wanting to tell you about what I think is the case to watch uh, before the U.S. Supreme Court right now, which is not the Arizona statute case, but the case involving the distribution of congressional seats to the states after, uh, after the census is finalized. Uh, that case is, uh, the court just agreed to hear that case, 
and it involves uh, a change to the way that we have always distributed congressional seats to the states. Uh, we do that, well, not always, but since, um, since the mid 1800s, uh, we distribute congressional seats to states based on total population. And the court is going to hear a challenge to the president's announcement that he is gonna to try to subtract people from state populations before distributing congressional seats. Uh, and the people that he has uh, targeted for subtraction are people he claim are here in violation of law, meaning undocumented immigrants. Uh, this is gonna shift the allocation of congressional seats away from certain states. And the president specifically mentioned the situation of California, um, but there are other states as well, including my state of Texas that are likely to lose uh, congressional representation as a result um, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, it's pending before the U.S. Supreme Court. And not only is it the case to watch, but I think it's so fundamental to our Constitution and the way that we operate our democracy that that would be the one issue that I would focus on right now. Great. Um, Mark, Braden, if you could champion one voting rights issue over all others, what would that be? Uh, well, you know, I think that uh, I am wildly in favor of, of, and this is, you get right down to election administration, I'm wildly in favor of uh, online registration uh, coupled with people voting in person following that. And I'm wildly in favor of work to make sure that the voting rolls contain eligible people. Uh, if we're going to expand mail voting and we're going to send out absentee ballot applications, or in fact, absentee ballots, then it's very important to go through the rolls and make sure we're sending them to people that actually exist. And we have a number of jurisdictions, more than you can count on your fingers and toes, that have more people registered to vote than people of voting age. So a process that would, would expand registration, doing it electronically is good, a process that would make our voting rolls better would certainly go a long way to make people feel the system has a higher degree of integrity. Again, it's just not a question of whether the system is a good system. It's vitally important that people believe the system is good. All right, um, Aaron. Briefly, because we got to get uh, Congresswoman Edwards I will and John Sherman. Sure. take a pass so that you can try and get more questions in. <laughs> uh, okay, John Sherman, if you could uh, champion one voting rights issue over all others, what would that be? Felon rights restoration. Almost three million people disenfranchised nationwide, and at least a million of those folks have already completed their entire sentence, um, including parole and probation. They'd be larger than most states if they were their own state. Uh, they need to be restored. Uh, the litigation has hit some snags, uh, but this is the, I think, the most important, one of the most important voting rights issues in the country. All right, Congresswoman Edwards, if you could champion one voting rights issue over all others, what would that be? Well, I'm gonna co-sign on John's, but I also would say, I think that we should make election day a national holiday so that everybody could vote when they needed to uh, to vote. And I think I would add to that universal voter registration. All right, I think um, actually your answers to that one question have encompassed about three or four of the questions that we had in our chat session. And I think at, at this point, we, we are just about out of time. Um, and I don't wanna risk going around with other questions that we won't have adequate time to respond to. I want to say a very special thank you to each of our panelists. You bring a, a wide range of perspectives um, and, and viewpoints across the political spectrum. Um, as we close out this um, um, part of our three-part series for the DC Bar Conference, the importance of the right to vote is paramount in a de democratic society. And our democracy is strong because we each participate and exercise our right to vote. And as lawyers, as members of the bar, um, we often have an, a unique perspective, at, which is sought out 
by those um, who need legal advice or have questions about the law of elections and how the process works. So thank you all for sharing your expertise. Um, I think we've expressed both an optimism about the integrity of our electoral system, but we also have some concerns, particularly during this unprecedented pandemic, uh, that our elections um, proceed freely, fairly, and openly uh, for all. That's essential to our democracy. So thank you all. Thank you to those who joined us um, for this panel. And at this point, I think we will um, actually be wrapping it up. Uh, I don't know if there is anyone from the DC bar that had any additional final closing remarks. Um, if not, uh, as we like to say here at the court, we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Judge, and our wonderful speakers for sharing your expertise during this discussion. We would like to thank My Case for your generous support. Next, we'll take a short break and return with more of the DC Bar 2020 Conference, 100 Years of the 19th Amendment. We'll see you back here shortly.
equal justice under law. It's a bedrock principle of our American democracy. But every day in the nation's capital, thousands of people are denied equal access to justice simply because they cannot afford a lawyer. For more than 40 years, the DC Bar Pro Bono Center has mobilized volunteer lawyers to deliver legal information, advice, and representation where and when it's needed most. Together, we help people who have been left out to understand the law, assert their rights, and seek justice in court. In neighborhoods that have been left behind, we strengthen nonprofit organizations and small businesses that are vital to the economic life of their communities. We stand with people to protect and preserve what matters most, their families, their homes, their futures. Equal access to justice transforms lives. Join us.